Unfortunately, such good deeds by themselves won't answer the sin problem faced by every person who has committed a sin. These good deeds may benefit society, but they will not absolve anyone of their guilt. Shalom, and welcome to Crosstalk International. I'm Josh Weiss, and this is episode four of an ongoing series that's based on a book, God, Forgive Me? It's by my father, Dr. Randy Weiss. This book talks about the necessity for a sacrifice to atone for sin. It's a concept that is relevant to both Jews and Christians. Well, in the last episode, which you can find on our YouTube channel if you missed it, we left off while talking about the shofar sounding. Now, during the Jewish High Holidays, which includes Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, it is a necessity to have the shofar sounding. This iconic sound is intended to be a tool that calls its listeners to return to repentance. I think that you can see how it might relate to the concept of atoning for sin. We're going to pick up right where we left off last episode. We have a lot to cover. Let's jump right in. Well, here's a better question. Why don't Jewish people use the horns from bulls or longhorn cattle for making a shofar? And the answer, although cows are classified as clean animals, the rabbis have forbidden the use of a cow's horn in the making of a shofar. They're not permitted due to the infamous event experienced during our exodus from Egypt. The children of Israel became impatient when Moses was delayed on Mount Sinai when he was receiving the Ten Commandments from God. The unforgettable event led to Aaron making a golden calf for God's people to worship. And as everyone knows, that didn't end well for the Jews. The cows, on the other hand, have successfully kept their horns from the makers of shofarot. But it didn't keep them from the burger joints, steakhouses, or leather good outlets in Texas souvenir shops that use every piece of a cow except the moo. Jews have always looked forward with great anticipation to the hearing of the blast of the ram's horn. One of Judaism's foremost rabbis had words of wisdom about the occasion. Maimonides is a rabbi who will be referred to again later in our conversation. He was a medieval Jewish sage, philosopher, and undoubtedly one of our greatest teachers. He said the following regarding the shofar. You who are asleep, wake up. Search your deeds and repent. Look into your souls, you who indulge all year in trifles. Amend your ways. Let each one of you give up his evil course and purpose. Much of this is about being broken. Brokenness is a key during this season. The days of awe are filled with reflection and solemnity. The Bible presents a truth about the need for a broken spirit and a contrite heart. Judaism accepts this view and vividly paints the picture that can teach all of us to humbly approach God. Being broken before God is more than the key to humility. It is a very special language that the God of Israel understands and hears with compassion. He desires to listen often and carefully to his repentant children. Jews and Christians alike should give thoughtful attention to the following wisdom. A man named Israel Baal Shem Tov offers a profound Hasidic insight into the meaning of prayer that explains it better than many examples of modern Christian literature. He wrote that in the palace of the king, there are many rooms and there is a key for each room. An ax, however, is the pass key of pass keys, for with it, one can break through all the doors and all the gates. Now, each prayer has its own proper meaning. And it is therefore the specific key to a door in the divine palace. But a broken heart is an ax which opens all the gates. God hears the prayer cried out from a broken heart. The solemn mood and reflective time of inner focus during the high holy days should move the honest person to deep humility and genuine repentance leading to a tender heart. So, 
we wish each other a happy new year. And how can one have a happy new year? Repent. The greeting offered to one another during the holiday season is Lishana Tova Tikotevu. May you be inscribed for a good year. This is a very real blessing to offer. The Rosh Hashanah prayer service focuses on Silichot, the penitential prayers. During this segment of the service, we make confession to God for our sins. We ask monumental questions during our High Holy Day liturgy. We wonder who shall live and who shall die, who will perish by fire, who by water, who by the sword, who by wild beasts, who by hunger, who by thirst, who by earthquake, who by the plague, who shall become rich and who shall become poor. We ask many of these things of God, and after each section of this sober prayer, we speak with faith, penitence, prayer, and charity can avert the evil decree. What can we be sure? Is penitence, prayer, and charity sufficient to warrant a reversal of God's decree against our sinful behavior? How do we gain assurance of forgiveness? And that, my friend, is the big question. Is fasting sufficient for forgiveness? Or do we need a good priest? <laughs> the topic of forgiveness is vast, and it's a fool's errand to deploy one small volume, one lengthy discussion and pretend to capture the immensity of what has been written by modern Jews or the rabbis who have helped form the modern Jewish view on the subject. The best I can hope to achieve herein is a brief summary of a few salient points about the Jewish view of seeking forgiveness from God. Many Jewish people understand that seeking forgiveness is a religious obligation. During our Jewish High Holy Days, we focus much of our attention on that crucial matter. The central theme of the Jewish Day of Atonement is to pursue God's forgiveness for our sins. Modern Rabbinic Judaism rests heavily on fasting to afflict the soul and forgiveness to cleanse the soul. Within the famous 18 benedictions of the Amidah, the fifth blessing calls for teshuva, which means repentance. This is followed by the sixth blessing of selicha, which is forgiveness. And by the way, for those in the know, the 18 benedictions, best known as the Shemona Esrei, are actually not 18 as titled, but rather there are 19. These 19 blessings are spoken three times daily by religious Jews, in the morning, the afternoon, and at the evening prayer services. On many Jewish holidays, a fourth reading of the blessings are also prayed, but on Yom Kippur, they are recited five times. After the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed in the year 70 of the Common Era, it was decided by the Council of Jamnia that this Amidah prayer would become the replacement for the animal sacrifices required by God to be slaughtered by the priests in the temple. A verse from Hosea, arguably ripped from its context, provided the justification for substituting these spoken blessings for the biblically mandated sacrifices. It's written, Return, O Israel, unto the Lord thy God, for thou hast stumbled in thine iniquity. Take with you words and return unto the Lord, say unto him, Forgive all iniquity and accept that which is good. So will we render for bullocks the offering of our lips. Unfortunately, the blessing that was added to the 18 benedictions was not a blessing. It was, in fact, a curse. The 19th benediction is known as the Birchat Haminim. This is specifically a curse upon people like me. It's awkward to know that my people would multiple times a day recite a curse for me. And I'm sure most of them don't even realize that's what they're doing, but 
You see, since the first century era of Jesus, many Jews like me began to believe that Jesus is the Jewish Messiah. As I like to say, Jesus is Lord and he was such a nice Jewish boy. <laughs> but it's not funny that we became known as the Minim, the apostates. Some ancient versions of the Jewish prayer books referred to those apostates as Notzrim, implying we were Jewish followers of the Nazarene. And we are. The words are painful to repeat, but I hear them at every Jewish prayer service. For the apostates, let there be no hope. And let the arrogant government be speedily uprooted in our days. Let the notes ream and the minim, the heretics, the apostates, be destroyed in a moment. And let them be blotted out of the book of life and not be inscribed together with the righteous. Blessed art thou, O Lord, who humblest the arrogant. Ouch. This is taken from an ancient Jewish prayer book found at the famous Cairo Geniza, as quoted by Solomon Schechter. Now, I must say that I believe in fasting and repentance. I also believe in forgiveness and prayer. Nevertheless, I am convinced that the Bible offers little support for atonement resting upon declaring a list of 19 benedictions called the 18 benedictions. Shimona Esrei. Even if they removed the horrific curse against me and the countless other Jews since the first century who have found hope in the Jewish Messiah, Reciting such a prayer will not replace the need for an atonement to remove the guilt of sin. The Bible suggests that repentance, fasting, and forgiveness must typically be accompanied by a sacrifice for sins. The Hebrew prophet Isaiah warned the children of Israel not to waste time fasting for religious satisfaction. He said, is such the fast that I have chosen? The day for a man to afflict his soul, is it to bow down his head as a bulrush and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Will thou call this a fast and an acceptable day to the Lord? Therefore, it's common to find enthusiastic, dedicated, active Jews involved in pursuing social justice, well-known, and well-meaning Jews have ardently assisted the underprivileged, oppressed, and marginalized in our society with religious zeal, from the civil rights movement to protest against wars, violence, nuclear proliferation, climate change, animal rights, advocacy, every heartstring cause manageable have been followed, led, or supported by Jews who care about doing what they believe to be the right thing with every imbalance that harms the weak or the poor, Jews have worked to bring balance and equity to every society we have inhabited. Unfortunately, such good deeds by themselves won't answer the sin problem faced by every person who has committed a sin. These good deeds may benefit society, but they will not absolve anyone of their guilt. Societal conditions may be improved, but the problem of sin in our world will not be satisfied without an atonement. God wants more than religious formality. God answered his own question with this exhortation. Is not this the fast that I have chosen, to loose the fetters of wickedness, to undo the bands of the yoke, and to let the oppressed go free, and that ye may break every yoke? A responsible interpretation of the text I just quoted reveals that God does want us to set the captives free. He does want us to feed the hungry. We should live in the service of compassion. God had his mind set on mitzvot, good deeds. But even the greatest of mitzvot would be insufficient without obedience to the sacrificial code and obeying his commandments. I think we also needed a good priest. Consider that the presence of the priests in the temple were an imperative for standard Jewish sacrifices. 
on the Day of Atonement, the high priest served in his most important capacity. He alone was commanded to enter the Holy of Holies in the temple. Now, here's a question. What was in the Holy of Holies? Well, the answer to that question varies from era to era. During the time of Solomon's temple, the Holy of Holies housed the Ark of the Covenant. But the Ark mysteriously disappeared from the text of Scripture and apparently also disappeared from the temple after that time. Therefore, the Holy of Holies was empty during the temple era except on Yom Kippur. On that sacred occasion, the high priest was called to engage the Lord on behalf of all Israel. So here's a question. How high was the high priest? And the answer is, he was at the top of the spiritual food chain. During temple days, the high priest had a sacred position. Though the individuals were not always holy, the position was reverenced with great awe. The New Testament provides first century evidence of the respected position based on how the Apostle Paul, Rav Shaul, interacted with the man in the office. The position held a recognized place of honor, even if the man in the position was not always honorable. And I guess this deserves an awkward note about the position of high priest. I think it's in order to explain that in ancient times, this position was handed down from father to son within a few priestly families. But this tradition was undermined to a certain extent by the Hasmoneans, who themselves priests appropriated this lofty position. After the rise of the Herodian dynasty and in the days of the Roman governors, corruption was involved in the appointment of priests. And the high priesthood was sometimes awarded to people who paid enormous sums in order to purchase the honor. The Yoma Tractate of the Talmud gives the best explanation of the priest's duties on Yom Kippur. His position of influence varied during different times in Jewish history. It's clear that the position carried with a tremendous power. The strong leadership and tight control held under priestly rule dominated ancient Israel from 445 BC all the way up until 37 before the Common Era. During the Persian occupation and the Hasmonean era, the high priest was, for all practical purposes, the ruler of the country. And it is known that Pilate was not a perfect prefect. Serving under him had its own challenges. Many of you have heard of Caiaphas. He was the priest over Jesus. And although Christians tend to view Caiaphas as the wicked Jewish ruler who presided over the mock trial of Jesus, they generally know very little about the position that he held. The most popular fact about Caiaphas is that he was a card-carrying Sadducee. The other leading players within first century Judaism were the Pharisees. The New Testament writers correctly present the Pharisees as the more orthodox group. And I do not support the view that the Jewish leaders or the Jewish people were inherently wicked, power-hungry, religious hypocrites. Undoubtedly, some examples existed, however, I totally reject such anti-Semitic stereotypes. For the most part, the Jewish leaders were sincere and honorable. Therefore, I believe it is time to remove the adjective pharisaical from our vocabularies. It has become an ugly expression implying religious hypocrisy that breeds contempt for the ancient leaders of the Jewish people. Those Christians who freely use the term often forget that Jesus exhorted his followers to observe the law while seeking to exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. So until we conduct ourselves with more dedication to biblical observance than they did, perhaps we should just tone down our rhetoric. Obviously, there were a few very bad apples in the bunch. And Jesus famously spoke harshly of their behavior and their horrible motives. Nevertheless, for many decades, the position of the scribes, Pharisees, and the high priests were rightly honored. F from a purely historical perspective, overlooking his part in the crucifixion, 
Joseph Caiaphas was good at his job. This is known because he ruled for 17 years without any major civil disturbance during his watch. And that was longer than any other high priest under Roman rule, making the feat even more impressive. For 10 of those years, Pilate was prefect. Now, in spite of the fact that he was a Sadducee, Caiaphas would have sworn before a special court to uphold the most orthodox traditions surrounding the entry to the Holy of Holies. This was because the high priest was the only person who could enter that sacred domain on Yom Kippur. Therefore, he swore to ensure that the ceremony was carried out in strict accordance with tradition. Dispelling another popular myth, it is a fact that the Jews of ancient Israel were quite autonomous under Roman rule in the early part of the first century of the Common Era. This was due in part to the success of Jewish leadership. You see, Rome did not actually govern Judea on a day-to-day basis. The local citizenry may not have liked the high priest, but they deeply respected the position. That level of respect and submission was the basis upon which the Romans chose to permit self-rule to the degree it was allowed. Rome saw it as the easiest method to control a remote, hostile, distant area of the empire without qualified and capable native leaders. Ancient Israel would have required more cost to control the area than it was worth. Later, Rome realized their error. The Jews carried out a major revolt against the Roman Empire between the years 66 and 70 of the Common Era. It failed miserably. But the Jews of Jerusalem didn't learn their lesson until they finally figured it out after experiencing Rome's scorched earth policy when it was implemented during the second unsuccessful Jewish revolt between 115 and 117 of the Common Era. It is often said that clothes make the man. Well, I would say clothes make the man and the priest. The pilgrimage festivals were of particular concern to Roman leaders. It was during these celebrations that pilgrims flooded Jerusalem to visit the temple. Even Jesus came from the countryside to the city for major festivals. Like everyone living outside of Jerusalem, he joined the tremendous crowds of Jewish worshipers entering the city at the appropriate times to visit the temple. Knowing that this pilgrimage happened regularly, Rome wisely retained control of the high priest during these important annual events in a very clever manner. The trump card needed to retain authority over the high priest was by controlling his vestments. By this, they were sure to keep the loyalty of the leaders. The high priest could not perform his duty without his priestly garments any better than Iron Man could zoom around without his suit or Superman could fly without his cape. Clark Kent needed a phone booth in the 1950s to don his Superman outfit. He'd never get off the ground today or he'd be running around in his shorts. Like Iron Man, the high priest had no superpowers until he was wearing his vestments. First Herod and then Rome took control of the high priest's vestments and released them only on special occasions. With them on, he wielded too much authority. Cases concerning control of the vestments and with it the appointment of the high priest more than once went directly to the Roman emperor for a decision. Who controlled the vestments and the office really mattered. You see, it mattered because the man in the office was intermediary not only between Rome and the populace, but also between God and his people. He was the one who on the Day of Atonement went into the Holy of Holies and who made atonement for the sins of the people of Israel. Rome understood the power held by the man in the position of high priest. So Rome guarded the symbols of that power to maintain their own control over the man who wore the vestments. The emperor recognized that a rogue high priest could destroy the order that Rome maintained through its governing strategy. 
You may have not heard of the term, but it's called a kittle. It was a white robe for purity, a kittle. Although different from the vestments of the priests, it is not uncommon for Jewish leaders and other observant Jewish men to wear distinct garb on the high holy days. A special white robe, known as a kittle, is a traditional garment worn in prayer during the season. The white color represents the purity that repentant believers seek to attain through prayer and fasting. The reason for the kittle does not end with hope for a clean slate. It also represents the white burial shroud that is used at traditional funerals. On Yom Kippur, we are meant to feel the touch of death, for death cuts through all the defenses and illusions we have carefully created around our own mortality. We are mortals. We all die. Death is the most common conclusion to life. Normally, we don't all die at the same time. That would create unbearable burdens for grave diggers. But one time, the certainty of death changed everything. Not only did everyone die, but they all died at once, including the grave diggers. Only the rain and floodwaters were literally able to drown out the screams of terror. Some people refused to believe a good God could have caused such suffering. Others reject God altogether because they don't want to believe in a God who violates their sense of fair play to such unbiblical thinkers, I would simply remind that life is not always fair and death is not negotiable. But the same God who wiped out those lost in the flood also offered forgiveness and mercy to those of us equally deserving of the death sentence decreed for sinners of every stripe. So instead of judging God's motives or actions for sending the flood described in the book of Genesis, let us consider the biblical account of Noah in light of sin and sacrifice as refined by the decrees of Moses. Well, unfortunately, we're out of time. So we have to pause things right there for now. But don't worry, we'll pick up right where we left off in the next episode. So stay tuned for that. If you'd like to dive into these things a little bit deeper and understand the concepts presented in this series, well, you're in luck. This whole series comes right from this book, God forgive me? In fact, we just ended chapter 5 and we'll pick up in chapter 6 in the next episode. And if you'd like to get a hold of this book, well, you've got two options. Go to crosstalk.org, click shop, and there you'll be able to order a physical copy of the book, or you can download a free PDF. It's that simple. I also encourage you to follow us on social media with the handle at Crosstalk TV. In this way, you don't miss anything. We look forward to hearing from you and connecting with you soon. I encourage you, feel free to give us a call at 1-800-688-3422. And until next time, shalom and God bless.